What's up, everyone? Tyler Timberline here, a.k.a. Toe Tag and Tambo. Back for another week, back for another edition of the Monday Review Show, going through all of the results across the DFS landscape for the weekend that just was PGA Tournament Northern Trust. So uh, the Dustin domination, I talked about it before. I was waiting for the Jim Nance call before I introduced TJ here. I think, you know, that was one way to describe it. There's a lot of opinions going around on how that tournament went down. And, you know, a lot of people were hating on it, that it was a birdie fest. And I really think the call was great. The Dustin domination is what it was. We had pegged the score. If you look at expert survey, everyone, the way they talked across the industry was, you know, 17, 16, 17, 18 under. And English got to 19. But besides that, no one came close except DJ, 11 strokes ahead. So uh, my main my main man co-host here, TJ Lasig at TJL5124. TJ, how you doing, man? And then what did you think of that, the overall tournament, and then just the DJ domination like we talked about? Tambo, good to be on as always. Yeah, I mean, I think it's something that I can't recall the last time we saw a performance that dominating. I mean, imagine being Harris English and on Thursday you say that you're going to shoot 19 under and just get blown out of the water. I mean, I think any of us thought 19 would have been good enough, but that's, that's some of the best golf that, that we've seen in, in years and maybe we'll see for a while. It's just a, a purely unbelievable performance by DJ and you know, I guess it makes for not an exciting finish down the stretch, but at the same time, it, it's kind of awesome to see someone playing golf at that elite of a level. Yeah, if you wanted to get your sweat in, it was it was absolutely incredible. If you wanted to get your sweat in yesterday, uh, besides showdown round four, which thanks again to STL Cards, my boy, covering for me. I uh, had a great weekend. I appreciate that a lot. And everyone filling in, Devin, the producer, everybody. But I would say that, you know, the only way you could kind of get a sweat down the stretch yesterday was to bet the outright market without DJ. Kind of let's who's going to come in second here. That's kind of what you were trying to figure out. And then English ended up doing it, but it looked like there was at times other guys that were sort of making a run at it and he was falling back a little. So uh, like you said, just a, a great overall tournament. I think, you know, beyond the birdies and stuff like that, it was really just DJ crushing and it was just nuts to see, right? He would hit a tee shot, pick up his tee and go. It's, he knew it was piped center of the fairway every single time. The, the rest of his game wedges, irons, everything looked good. And then he was dropping putts. And when that happens, those type of scores happened. I think it was cool. He got to the 30 under, got the job done. And I wonder if the Brooks comments back at the PGA had anything to do with it. But, you know, Brooks had to withdraw before the event started and DJ put up a score like no other. So we'll be interesting to see at the end of this video. We're certainly going to preview what next week looks like or, or this week now, I should say, coming up here for the BMW Championship. Go through some of that. We're down to 70 guys. Um, let's talk about some other stuff, though. Let's do some uh, of last week, TJ. Go through it. Uh, for those of you that don't follow these videos before or haven't been on with us, want to just take a quick look back as far as recap. It's all part of it. TJ, man, you were on some great plays here. Check out this conviction value in the lineup HQ last week. You had Harris English, eventual second place finisher. Taylor Gooch and, and Cameron Davis knocked the socks off those prices as far as value and output. I know uh, Cam Davis was a little bit disappointing on Sunday for some, but man, for 6300 that was a, you know, a great output for him at that. So just talk to me a little about that. And then how'd you do on the week? Yeah. So had a, had a pretty, pretty good week overall. Nothing, nothing crazy, but managed to take cash pretty much across the board, which is, which is always nice. So Harris was my, my probably top play of the week. I just thought that he was too cheap for his price. And, and luckily it worked out for him. I had two guys right at that range that I liked Harris English and Abe answer, obviously, answer went with the missed cut but Harris just has been playing really solid golf lately I, and I was actually one of the things that I was thinking of him was that he was more of a of a safety play than necessarily an upside play but he kind of proved that wrong right. this week being able to come in all the way to second so really solid there and then yeah when, when looking at cheaper golfers I'm, I'm often looking for guys that can spike and guys that can can make some birdies from a DK for, scoring perspective so Cam Davis I think fits that mold to a T did it again this week he was he was on fire for three rounds there not so great on or I guess two rounds not so great on the weekend but even when he has a bad round he's still making tons of birdies making some eagles so he's gonna help mm -hmm. you from a of a DK scoring perspective and then same thing with Gooch one of the things I noticed about Gooch is that he's pretty much either been missing the cut or finishing in the top 20 so when you're looking at cheaper guys for GPPs that I'd rather take that upside there understand that sure sometimes he's going to miss the cup but when he makes it through to the weekend he can put up some numbers and, and has had some pretty decent scoring finishes yeah I, I like that call I took that approach in a couple things we'll look at it I've you know speaking of English versus answer your yeah, answer's not showing up here for you know an obvious reason he's not going to be there this week because he didn't perform right and I know I joked with Dan Bach about the uh, you know four dots of death because all four of us had answer 
in here yeah. as one of our plays, whether it was core conviction, you know, value, anything. It was all good at 7.7 K. Uh, I still liked him more than Siwoo and M, which were at the same price, but I really wish, and I'll show you in a second that I had to just take an English in a certain lineup. But you know, for me, it was a okay week, uh, pretty much break even. And that's the thing to say, but it was, it was more than that. I'm talking DK only. And I'll show you why I had some great results. It just didn't, couldn't get over the finish line. Had another second in an FGWCQ. It's my second, second place in three weeks. So that one hurts. Want to get in, get one of those tickets, you know, for five bucks. And, and they've got some bigger ones too. I'm trying to chase it a little bit just to at least get a shot in it. I kind of like that spot this year. Hopefully uh, they convert it. They haven't confirmed or denied yet. They did say, they said it's not going to be live and they sent out an email and said, would you like it to be live? So I'm not sure if they've made the final decision, but we'll see what goes on with the way the world landscape is. Uh, and then the other thing was I had the DJ outright. So Love the, the DJ bet at 20 to 1. Anytime you want to give me that, I'm going to hit it. And so that was a, a fun one to hit, and it was pretty much over on Saturday. I think, you know, everyone felt that way when he was playing that good of golf going into Sunday. Had, he had lost a six-stroke lead over at the HSBC China before, but it, was, it wasn't likely to happen here again. He was just playing such good golf, too strong, could, was just overpowering the course. So uh, as far as that, the other thing I wanted to showcase for you was just your breakdown here because I've been using this a lot since you started bringing this article out. It's helped me a ton. I just know that, you know, one of the biggest areas and everyone has to take their own insight and use it in their own way. But what I would say is if, if you find an area of your game you struggle in, and for me, it's single entry to three max. So I've really been trying to focus on that a lot more going forward. And I think this is a great way to do it because you're using these plays that I know in some big dollars, small field lineups, and, and those are sort of the spots you're going to need these. And then if you're taking away some of the other stuff and the evergreen content that TJ and I are going over in these videos, when we'll get to the breakdowns in a second of how people are constructing their rosters, you are going to see that these are where the plug and play situations come in. And I'm loving that this still keeps coming up because when I show you mine, it's going to be, uh, it, it hurts. Let's just say that, but a answer in English, they're right there. You know that you got one in this tier that was dominant one that hurt us all. That's fine. Uh, this one here, Doc, again, disappointing. He ended up actually being the bubble boy. He came 71st in the FedEx Cup standings, but you had Gooch and really br breaking it down good, right? You just talked about it here, but, you know, boom or bust, like you said, made sense. And we're going to also talk about that at the end. This week is a week. We're back to now. There's no more cuts. So we're going to need people that can outscore their finishing position or do both and, and get up there and score. So uh, like English did this past week. And then Punt plays the same thing. Norlander, not the greatest. But Cam Davis right there in the mix. So you had one in every tier that was really dominant for the price. So shout, shout out to you. Great work, TJ. Any more comments you want to make on this article and really where you, your mindset is when it comes to writing this thing each week? Yeah, so I, you can see when I first started writing it, I was just picking six value plays. And now I've tried to, to format it into these three different sections just to give you a feel for, for which golfers I think are the best plays in particular contests. So when I'm talking optimal plays, like you said, single entry, three max, cash games, smaller field type stuff. These are the guys that I just think are the highest equity plays, but but are likely to come with some ownership. And then I try to give two GPP plays that you know may or may not be low owned, but but I think have some upside. And then two punt plays under 7K. Just and I try to try to have one of my GPP plays be one of the cheaper ones too. So yeah, mm -hmm. I mean I think like you said, it's about picking the bits and pieces that that you like. Uh, I would find it, you know, it, it's value play. So I'm likely not going to smash all six every week. But if you read the content, put some of your own flavor to it, I think hopefully you can can find some nuggets there and combine it with the other content that the guys are providing. And I think I, I was looking back at, I mean, you guys were on DJ. I was on some of the value plays. You, you certainly could have found that right combination and, and made the GPP winning type lineup from the stuff that we had out this yeah. past weekend. De definitely a strong mashup. I was going to go to that next. That's a good segue. I mean, there's always going to be some some hits and misses for sure. But, you know, you look at some of these plays. I, I really liked uh, Scott. You like Xander. They're, you know, about the same. Xander had a great finish, actually. So he did much better. But I'm saying that's a, an example where, again, not everyone's going to come through answer and can't lay. Uh, next stage, you know, Cards and I were both heavy on DJ. You were on Rom. I also liked Rom. He would be the next guy in the tier that I was sort of on there. And we'll get to that as we go through. Salary savers, man, my guy, Louie, no one wants to play him. I'm going to play him again this week. We're going to talk about it later, but it's just he keeps going. And I know yesterday wasn't the best round for him, but at 7,500 last week, that to me was great. You know, you had English in there. You had Davis, which I thought was strong. Uh, Jacob had Hondizel had Louis as well. So uh, lots of good options in there. And of course, you know, Noto had English. So pretty much everyone was on something. We all, so this is where I hate myself, and we'll go to it next. It's going to come up here. I keep saying we're going to talk about We will. 
uh, English all over the board. Let's say we're all over English. Keep going here. We were underweight on the Rory's, the JT's. You, you were a little bit off. <laughs> a little bit off, DJ. just a little. Just a little, just a little, little bit. bit. So that <laughs> you're like, it's probably like me, right? Hindered your upside yeah. a little bit for the week, right? You you got you got in yeah. good still. You didn't necessarily need him in something like a cash game or all that. You could still get by. Not a lot of remember too. Not a lot of people played DJ. He was you know eight to ten to twelve percent in certain tournaments. It wasn't very high, so people weren't really on board of DJ. He was extremely low owned in the DFS tournaments over the weekend. Uh, we all like ball strikers and approach. You know, I had Scott. I thought I really thought he was going to do something, but I had DJ second to him. You had a bunch of guys up there. Xander, Rom, Cards had the winner. DJ with English in third. So, I mean, there's there's definitely a mashup here of what you can use, and that's why we look at it each week. And like I said, we all expected these 16 to 17 range scores. So the fact that DJ just blew it out of the water and then nobody else did just was more, to me, a testament about how good DJ played versus how good the field played. So we'll see some other opinions on that. I, I, do, I do think it's true, you know, on Dizzle, nailed it. Favorite bet of the week, DJ, got it. Uh, you know, I talked about it on the Fantasy Golf Degenerates podcast, which when we do our preview later, Kenny and I always go a little bit more in-depth, so be sure to check that out later on. And then some of the long shots, you know, he had Louis didn't quite get there. Uh, you know, those maybe weren't, but they're a long shot for a reason. I don't want to spend too much time here, but just want to go back through a couple other things I saw. Uh, you know, Cards and I both wrote up DJ for a uh, top contrarian golfer. And he was eight to 10% loved him in, in uh, big field stuff. And so there, and then you had Adam Scott, who I also loved. So it all, it all was in there. It's just a matter of what you did with it and how you built it. And like I said, we'll go now into it here and, and we'll get to PGA one eight five. I always like to show you guys if I've got something, not always do I have something, but uh, I hope to, but yeah, for, 44th place, 658 points. It was no dupe. But uh, this lineup was my best lineup. It was a DJ. Guys I was on were DJ, Scott, English. We just went through the article. Louie, all those guys were in there. My favorite long shot was Keegan Bradley. Uh, this is sort of how you see me using the content to build my own lineups. And then I wasn't really super high on web. I liked him more as the week started. If you caught the Wednesday show with myself and Noto, I said, look, he definitely seems underpriced for how good of a golfer he is, but it's kind of the right place for him. But you can really see how this lineup came together. Webb would have been like my last man in. It's all the guys that I was on heavy. My favorite long shot, you know, bet as far as 200 to 1 each way goes. And then it just fit Webb. I'm going to play Webb in a lineup like that because the construction sort of comes together, right? Two guys under 10, two guys in that 10 to 13, another guy at 15. Uh, and actually DJ because he came in under. So that, that one actually was a little bit more aggressive. But I want to go down just a little bit further if I can. Because this is the one I'm talking about that really stings. Yeah, 230th place. 613.5 with the Abe answer miscut. And if oh, Abe answer, yeah, and look at, and I've got, look, this is where I like I, my own faults. I look at it afterwards and I say, you know, maybe I didn't put it together properly because you got DJ at eight. I got Scheffler at nine, who was a conviction play for me. I got Louis at six. I use some of the information like your guys call. I like Cam Davis, talked about him on the podcast with Kenny earlier in the week. But I've got four guys underneath that percentage. If I had to just move it, you know, answer was chalk too. But let's just say I, I leave the 100 bucks on the table and put English in there. I score 718 on the week. And it's all what ifs. Everybody has these situations. It just goes to show that what I'm looking at more and being real with myself is the construction process. And that's what we analyze. Yeah, 702.5 took this thing down. Again, all these guys in the top 50 to 100 will have a story like that they could tell. I'm just going through it for, you know, my reflection back because we try and help you guys with this stuff and go through this content with you to see how you can construct these lineups. Answer chalk there was not really necessary that I could have just as easily played English, got a little bit more safety in there when I already had a bunch of guys that were one in 5% owned and who knows, right? It could have been a whole different story. So uh, talk to me about the winner though, TJ. Let me open it up to you here. We got PJ185, congrats to him, Roto Grinders member, uh, DJ Berger, Scott, Scheffler, English, Davis. What do you think of the lineup? it's a great lineup and a lineup that, that you can reasonably get to, right? I mean, sometimes we see lineups winning these tournaments and we look at them and go, ah, you know, I, I never would have played that guy or this guy. But, I mean, obviously had to have DJ and English here. I think getting DJ at, at 8% is obviously results-oriented fantastic. But even even before then, I think you guys even called it out as, as a great lower-owned contrarian play. And I think he, he reminded us this past weekend that, 
when when every golfer has got their A game, that the DJ has got the best or A plus game. DJ has got oh, the insane. the best A plus game in the world. So you know, I, I think it, my, myself included, I, I get down on him for the you know the shooting 80s and the withdrawals, and mm -hmm. I just need to erase those from my memory and realize that when when DJ comes to show up, he he's the best golfer in the world and has that upside that no one else has. Berger is someone that continues to just put up the results and I feel like people don't want to believe it myself included for some reason and I don't really know why I don't believe it because not only are the results there but all the underlying stats are there he's doing everything well and he's finishing well every single week so I mean he comes in at 19% ownership but I mean he continues to be a great play Scott was the guy that I was on Scheffler another strong week from him going out shooting the, the 59 shooting? 59 59 yeah Another birdie maker type, and then we already talked about like Cam Davis. So re really, really strong lineup here. Leaves the three hundred on the table as well. Uh, really, really nice, nice lineup, and and well deserved win here. Yeah, and the structure was similar to what we talk about, right? If you look at that, like Scheffler was right there at nine, DJ was right there at eight. One more of them, and it's kind of the the same balance. I, I did like the overall construction. You know, one six, one seven, one ten and skip the 9K range, right? I know, you know, PJ185 had 20 lineups, but it's only 20 in a tournament where you could put up to 150. So I uh, had to take some stands somewhere. And like you said, it's tough to see. I don't know if it's this master snub thing that's going around with Berger, where because the early uh, shutdown and restart, the way it all happened with that, it, he didn't actually qualify for Augusta. There's, you know, strict rules in place to how they do it. Everyone's talking about he needs to get that uh, special invitation for a special year, special circumstances. Maybe that's fueling him and driving him. But, I mean, Berger was great three events straight before the before the shutdown and has really been great ever since. Won right off the restart and, and then has kept it going ever since. So, like you said, it's hard to believe. And maybe it's because he was a bit chalky at 20%. We all said, you know, you can't play chalk Berger. And there's definitely other golfers that were around him that you were happy to play. You know, I really like Reed for 100 bucks more. But look where it got me, right? Look at Daniel Berger's numbers. DJ, as you mentioned, Back to world number one, 172 DK points is just insanity. And then, you know, the five Eagles, whole thing with that. And then also, uh, you know, just the overall, like you said, the A-plus game. I think Rory, you know, reminds me of another guy that when he's playing as A-plus, you're just like, wow, this is just some crazy stuff. But like you said, I think DJ's is better. When, when, and, he, and he's shown it more often. He's got two wins now coming off the restart. And yes, there's the 80-80 withdrawal in between. But, you know, that's DJ for you, right? Some That week... I believe it was the Memorial. He was just over it, right? It wasn't quite, you know, Bryson, 10 cup, 10 ball, get out of here type deal. But it was, you know, I'm done with this tournament. Let's move on. We'll sight set on the next one. Uh, really, really interested to see what people do with DJ this week. Uh, Vegas has him at like eight to one. And then, you know, going into the next event, if there's anyone that can go back to back, there's only so many. People normally don't like to play the winner, uh, previous winner off the, off the win. But there is a bit of a special circumstance going into a smaller field of 70 versus a normal field where it's like, okay, it's this many guys playing, you know, absolute ludicrous golf, as we've mentioned multiple times here, and then having the Vegas number to go with it, almost Bryson-esque back at the Rocket Mortgage Classic where he was 7-1, to one, and people are like, what is this? This is DJ in a stronger field at 8-1. to one. So, you know, smaller field, but stronger field. So, will be very interesting to see what people do with that. Uh, as far as the rest of this goes, I mean, the one thing that stands out to me this week, and we're going to go through it pretty quick on these next few, is just watch as the scores change, right? So 702.5 is a pretty beastly score to take this thing down. Again, congrats to PGA 185. $500,000 is huge, outright ship, absolutely incredible. It's you know winning a major. That's what you've just done. So fantastic job. Uh, moving to drive the green, which is the $5, similar setup. You know, this has 73,000. This goes up to 107. A litany of scores that are above that, right? That uh, you see. So you've got, you know, 722, 710.5, 708.5, 706, 705, JT Bergeson, you know, good guy. See him around on Twitter. Shout out to him. Another, you know, Roto Grinders member, PSU Mav, another one. These guys are using Dust Pop 150 lineups. I mean, th this is the difference as well. You look over here, there was nobody with 150 that even sniffed the top. And over here, there's three with over 135 that are right up there. And the scores differentiate quite a bit. So, Talk to me about Dust Pop sign up. Sitting right up there first, $100,000 win. Congrats to Dust Pop. A little bit different construction than what we just saw. Obviously, some of the same guys will be in there, but you know, the DJ English thing, they're going to be everywhere. But what do you think about this construction? Yeah, I like this jamming in two of the 10K plus guys and then just jumping right down almost all the way to the 7Ks with a, a low 8K in Scheffler. Uh, getting that, 
even I guess more more contrarian than the typical ownership breakdown. Although th- this week seemed like one where there wasn't a ton of chalk, right? Like there right. wasn't there wasn't definitely, the thirty five percent owned guys. Yeah, it was more right. spread out. So you know we're not going to see a lot of twenty eight percent owned guys in this field, and, and that's what mm-hmm. you get with the stronger field. It, it makes sense. Um, yeah. I, I think one other comment is that it doesn't surprise me to see some of the MME guys getting here just with with the fact that DJ won and and blew blew everyone out for mm-hmm. people making one to five lineups, DJ probably wasn't going to make the cut for them. Whereas mm-hmm. when somebody's making 150, of course you're gonna you're gonna sprinkle him into your MME mix. So that was just mm-hmm. a, another thought there. And yeah, Alex Noren, a nice off the board lower own play there too. I feel like he's I actually don't know for sure off the top of my head, but it seems like he's been popping up a bit here and there, but it's not someone that, that ever seems to get talked up too much. So he'll probably, yeah, he's like a, he's like a cheaper version of, and... yeah, che- cheaper version of Louis L. Right. It's just a guy yeah, that nobody yeah, ever wants. Really different is. reasons. It's not the withdraws and the whatever, and the does he have his bed, you know, tired narratives, but it's, you know, just a guy that people just aren't always on or, or want to put any heavy investment into. And it's a guy that can pop at any time and play at a course like this and play it well. And he had to do some, movement on Sunday. And I think he shot a 68 on Sunday, had some ups and downs, but certainly scored well enough and 101. That'll get the job done. I, I like your call there. You know, these guys are going to be sprinkling a little more in JT Bergerson is regular, you know, very good player. As far as MME goes, awesome to see him get here. 40 K didn't quite at the top, but a fantastic lineup. Nonetheless, uh, you know, another build kind of like we saw before right now, the difference here is he got there with no six K guys and no nine K guys. So I think again, unique builds, are what you're looking for in these large fields as we talk about quite often. And this one just stands out to me as that you're skipping the nine K range completely. You're skipping the six K range. And then look at the golfers you get, right? You get DJ burger Rose, whatever you want to say about Rose, but man, he came through again. Kisner has been playing some great golf. We'll talk about him for this week, English, who we know, and we knew the DJ English thing would be or any of these sort of, you know, getting up near the optimum. I think the optimum was like 738 or something like that. So these guys definitely crept up a little bit closer than what we saw in the previous tournament, the $25. And then my guy, Louis O, who I mentioned, right? I'll just keep playing him if nobody else wants to play him. 7500 bucks, 97 points with a terrible Sunday mixed in. So, I mean, this, to me, looks a lot better. Anything else stand out to you about this lineup or, or in general? Just one of those lineups that with, with six really, really good golfers, right? Long-term, short-term, whatever. You just look at those six names and you know that those are six solid golfers there. And that continues to be something that we see week in, week out on these shows. It's the guys like the the Justin Roses, the Jason Days that that keep popping into those. And maybe they're not the most consistent golfers, but they're the kind of guys that when they're on their A game, they, they've been top golfers in the world at different points in their career. And any given week, they can easily get themselves back into that, that form. So I think that's something to continue to consider on a week-to-week basis is try to, to push any short-term craziness outside of your mind and just pick good golfers and in the long term hope that those pieces connect one week and you hit it big and and i was just going to tie that in it's a great point it's like i said like the if you're if your sixth man in is louis o and english has been playing some good golf as has louis kisner's been playing some great golf burger we just talked about has been playing some incredible golf and it just keeps going and then the guy that played the absolute best golf and not like i said the 78s and the the 80s and the withdrawals and whatever that'll get in people's head but this is a guy that's just dominant and, and always could be. We knew that. If Justin Rose is, if Louis O's your sixth man in and Justin Rose is the guy you're feeling the worst about, that's a pretty damn good lineup, right? And if you go back here, I should just note, it's not a, a shot at you. It's a good takeaway. I think people need to learn and, and focus on. And you, I'm not, it's not, I didn't mean it like that, but I guess my point is you mentioned earlier, you got a lower price guy, Gooch in here, and then your punt plays are Norlander and Davis. And what I meant by that is the only thing we really didn't talk about on that is you don't need to put these three guys in your lineup. And you didn't say we needed to. That's what I meant by that. I just, I think that's what I want people to try and learn from this stuff is how you might want to use the content and apply it is you can set up a rule. And when I do my lineup HQ show on Wednesdays, we talk about it, right? Put max of one of these guys. Certainly you might want to have Cam Davis in your lineups. Check out first place in both those tournaments, Cam Davis, 6,300. But when you look at the second lineup, and that's what I was trying to tie in there and maybe a poor way of wording it, just to say, look, you don't always need to say, oh, here's my three gems. I'm going to roll these three and get all three big dogs in there. Rory, you know, Rom and DJ with these three and I'm going to win. Well, even if they come one, two, three, like you're asking for a six-way parlay to hit with like three super underdogs, 
right? It's not really probably the best allocation of your resources to try and have that parlay hit when you can put together a more balanced one. And this is results oriented because this one came in second place, but it's not really the point. The point is when you've got a lineup like this and your worst guy in, or your sorry, your least price guy in is Louie. And the guy you may be the most concerned with as far as recent form and whatnot goes and just overall, uh, you know, scaredness or whatever you want to call it of, of how you want to build your lineup out is Justin Rose. You've got a really good lineup there. So use something like this. I really do like this and we'll move on unless any other takeaways from you there, TJ or follow-ups. No, absolutely. Completely agree. You I, get what I mean, right? Like that's, yeah. You know, I mean, I would tend to not want to put, like you said, two of those punt play type guys into one lineup. It's about picking your spots, finding the the construction that, that fits you and, being able and open to, to multiple constructions, right? Looking at ones where you don't yeah. go into the 6K range at all, looking ones where you throw in someone like a Cam Davis and then build around there. Ones where you have, we saw the the right here, the ROM, DJ lineup, two studs, but then relatively balanced after that. Like, right, they, they got DJ and ROM in, but they weren't complete. I mean, I guess Grillo is arguably a little bit of a punt, but not, not you know, two sixty three hundred dollars guys. So tons of different yeah, ways that you can go about it. Uh, I think that's the key point. It's more of a takeaway of how can we use the content? How can we apply it to fit the sort of bill of what we're trying to get to? Because everything we're talking about is results oriented, right? We've got the real results right here in front of us. We're seeing the tournament, uh, you know, it, we're seeing the result of the tournament and the person that won the money right here. And we'll get to Sammy Noel in a second. But the point is more, how can we construct these things going in to feel good about them, be unique, give ourselves a real shot to take this thing down and then hopefully see the results on Sunday. And that, that was sort of more of the takeaway there. And I think that's, you know, just, it wasn't really implied up front. And we're, that's what I wanted to say is, you know, you can do that now. We will talk about also applying it on a week to week basis. And what I mean by that is this is a week with 70 guys in the field, no cut event, pretty good names where then, yes, there is more of a, a case or a theory to be made around maybe using two of those punt plays and then jamming in four studs because, they can outscore their finishing position. So even if they don't do their job and come top 10, like you would hope they may come 15th or 20th, but score may come 20th, but score in the top 12 or the top 15. So we'll get to that at the end. Special shout out here to Sammy Knoll, uh, you know, heavy, heavy in the streets on Twitter. He's been around the game, some big wins, a former millionaire maker winner. Awesome guy. Didn't get a chance to meet him myself at the DFS open last year, but I know he was there when everybody sort of from the PGA DFS industry got together and went down and played some golf in Florida for a weekend there. But, you know, great win to him. This was a blowout. If, if there was some DJ domination, Sammy Noel did the exact same thing in this tournament. 682 to 635 to then 622. I mean, this was almost like how the tournament played out, right? DJ, English, you know, not even close, but at least close and beating his peers. And then it gets a little more balanced after that. Uh, you mentioned a little bit on it, but DJ, Rom, Berger, Palmer, Grillo, Davis. What do you think the thought process was here? And then what do you think about the overall lineup? Yeah, so I figured that this one was that they really, he really liked DJ Ramen Berger and wanted to build a lineup around that core. And once you do that, you know that you're going to have to go three cheap with the next remaining spot. So, and you know that, you know, Ram Berger and maybe DJ are going to be a little bit chalky. So, but also once you get down to the low sevens, no one was really popping for much higher than 10% anyway. So I think Cam Davis is an easy fourth person to plug in there. And then it's a matter of, okay, which, which two low 7K guys or another 6K guy, another 7K guy do I want? And he ran, ran into a, a great combination here at very, very low ownership in Palmer and Grillo. And I think Palmer is someone that we've seen put up some pretty, pretty good results lately as well. I think he's, he's been similar to like a Gooch where he's either missing the cut or he's, he's, showing up there and, and putting up a good showing. So, and I, I'm not too sure, honestly, what Grillo has been up to. He wasn't honestly someone that was on my personal radar last week, but he certainly wasn't on mine. He I, has I know, popped a little I, I bit. He's a classic guy that can't putt. So maybe he yeah. uh, made a couple of putts this week. It might've been his last man in, right? I think one of the things, yeah. to know, a couple of things to note here. One is, you know, a side note of a narrative is the Grillo putts better on, on faster bent grass. And that's been a quote in the past. So sometimes people will give him a little bit of leeway there and just hope that, this is the week we do it with Neiman. We do it with Finau. You know, the can't lay. The, they're not great putters at times, but we want to get them on a surface that they're better on. And that's whatever. You know, people will talk about that and say it's garbage narrative, but it's, sometimes it comes true. Uh, the other thing is Grillo's been playing some okay golf recently. just hasn't been stringing together four rounds. And look at here, 85 points. He didn't do it again. He just did enough, right? And in a tournament like this, and it was already 
contributed to with the blowout. I thought the interesting point was uh, in this lineup was no English was required. Didn't have English. Yeah. Um, the other thing I thought it was interesting was that Rom and Palmer, uh, they won the Zurich Classic, which got Palmer, you know, a little bit of job security a year and a half ago now or whatever. It's the team event. But, you know, R Palmer always seems to play good at events where Rom did. Think about the Memorial, right? They popped off together. And I know it's hard to correlate in golf, but they were in the, the final pairing. They were, you know, right there side by side. Uh, you know, their buddies obviously playing together in the Zurich and get the win. So it's kind of interesting just to see that, you know, that side by side. And then I think the reason I say Grillo, uh, you know, I can't go inside the mind of one Sammy Noel, but Cameron Davis was almost an easy punt play this week just to say I'm comfortable with him. You don't know how it's going to pan out, but you knew it would be under 10%. You knew, you know, sometimes values at this price and you're like, okay, $6,300, almost 10%. I got to pivot away from that. But it was one where we had just seen too much out of him, too, you know, too much scoring. And there was already a limited cut, right? It was, it was only 125 or we ended up being 123 with the Brooks and Von Taylor withdrawals where you get Cameron Davis in there. 6,300, I think he was an easy play. And like you said, if he liked DJ Ron Berger and he liked Davis, all you're doing is comparing 2v2s in the end of who fits. And you could have looked at it, but then here's another point. Again, I can't go inside his mind to ask him, but when you get down to those two, which I could see it very easily being this was the decision, and that's why we're just talking through it and even making up some of this stuff, but it is a good thought process to think through, is he says, look, I know English is a great play at 7,600, but then look what that forces me to do, right? And I'm not saying Grillo is any better than like the Gooch or any of those plays that were down there. But I mean, then he would have blown the field out even more, right? You go to English and Gooch here and he destroys this thing by even more. And it's not that he needed to. The point is more of maybe he says, look, I don't really want those two 6K guys because it's hard enough as it is to hit down there and kind of speaks a little bit to what we were just talking about and whether or not that was his thought process. This is good for everybody to think about in our thought process. Any, any thoughts on that or follow up, TJ? Yeah, that was my first thought too, is that if I was personally building that lineup where you fit in those three, you go Cam Davis, uh, I, pro I probably would have gone English and then looked at something like a Gooch, which obviously would have worked out as well. But, you know, m maybe I also wouldn't have wanted to be, to or maybe I would have gone uh, English and Norlander and then you had a miscut, right? So that, that's exactly yep. why I think. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a complete coin flip between whether you land on Gooch or Norland or anyone in those 6K range, and then you, you get that increased volatility. So, yeah, and also uh, Grillo, think, think Grillo hasn't point. really been a Grillo hasn't really been a boomer, but as much of a boomer bust guy as of late. He'll typically make the cut for you, especially in right. a limited cut fashion like that. And then let's see what you get from him for upside. His boomer bust is almost like the weekend because he makes it to the weekend often enough. Then it's like, okay, what's he gonna do? Is it gonna be Grillo? 64 80 is it going to be grillo 80 64 like which guy's going to show up on the weekend with with emiliano grillo it's always tough to tell uh anything else on this lineup or should we move on no move on great, great lineup congrats to sammy Null. yeah really nice uh this is the guy actually right here rmsh rmschr12 this is the guy uh with this exact lineup actually who got me in the queue so cool cool to see mm. he got the qualifier and he had it here for second for 70,000, this is a, you know, actually it's a different lineup than he got me with, but I know for a fact it's the same guy. Same it's a guy. little okay. bit of a variation of this because I know he had Louie in his and whatnot. But yeah, it was a, a bad sweat for me for that because it was another one where I blew out third place but just didn't come close to his. I was 10 or 12 points back, needed a little bit more love on Sunday from Webb. It was that main lineup that I showed you guys in the $25. Um, moving on, and I thought we'd just do a little bit different one because here it kind of falls right in the middle. And it was interesting that this was like this, you know, 635. I felt like this was low. I know it's single entry and you only really get one bullet in here. You only, you do only get one bullet here. It's the $200 driver. So, you know, it's for people that are looking for a little bit cheaper, you know, a little bit higher dollar though, still $200 and then getting in on a single entry with a, you know, decent sized field, but a, a beatable field, I would say in 1945, Rye MC 23 with 635.5, a little bit off the board as far as the, the build went. Right. But uh, you know, got the job done for a hundred thousand. Do, do you ever play this tournament TJ or what's your overall thoughts on something like this? Because you can get in for $200 play against less than 2000 people and have the upside of a hundred thousand, 40,000, 20,000. I mean, you can make a lot of money in this tournament if you do want to take your shot. So what's your thought on using yeah. this as a strategy to build up? And then you could talk about the lineup. It definitely was a little bit more unique than the other ones we saw. Yeah, it's a, it's a great one to bring up actually. Cause I think it's a, like you said, it's kind of that, 
middle ground where it's not a ridiculously high buy-in. It's not a ridiculous number of entrants and it's only one entry. So, and I also think it's worth noting. I mean, I do play this tournament every week. I just play my, my one optimal, like possibly pretty chalky lineup. And I'm sure that a lot of guys are doing that too. So it's probably an interesting one where if you want to take the strategy of, you know, knowing that you're going to be a little bit more contrarian, that there's going to be some heavy, heavier chalk. And again, like I said, th- this week there wasn't a ton of chalk that gravitated towards a couple guys, but certain weeks there would be. And yeah, it's just a much easier field to beat than trying to beat, you know, a hundred thousand people and a ton of upside obviously at the top and, and not a terrible pay. I mean, it's not the flattest payout structure, but it's also not insanely top heavy. Yeah. I don't so. mind it at all. I, I play it weekly too. I think you made a good point there of the single entry strategy. So for those that don't follow along or, or do it often enough, I mean, I certainly still suck at it. I've learned the hard way. My, one of my biggest challenges is about that balance of it, right? Like most people are putting an optimal quote unquote, or a chalk type lineup in there. Now this week's a little bit different. I scrolled down to the sixth place, uh, J R Redden, just to show like, that's almost as chalky as you could get was like Ricky Fowler, Hatton, Hovland woods, all in double digits, but they, none of them even exceed 15%. Uh, you know, you got DJ at seven, Kokrak at three. So it's like, it was really tough to have a chalky lineup. And then we'll go back to Ryan MC 23 in a second. But yeah, there's that factor of it that you just mentioned of wanting to, I think going off the board in a sense is good strategy where, you know, most people are putting these more optimal plays in, but at the same time, we just talked about it with everything else is not getting too far off the board. And I wouldn't say this winning lineup st- like that at all, because if you look here, he's got Rory DJ. I mean, obviously two fantastic players, Hovland, Kisner, the same. Davis, who we know is a fine value play. And this is almost like a, a kind of like a version of Sammy Knowles that he had there. If you put Rory down to Rom, Hovland up to Berger, it would have been a similar scenario where he could have had English here and done even more at the same price tag. Kisner still had a great week, but English had like 24 more points, 25 more points, and then had to make that decision on that final golfer. And Hubbard was fine. So I don't mind this build at all. I think it was a, a strong build. 10, 13, 8, 9. I mean, it's close enough. And then two low owned at 7 and 1. So uh, I think it was a strong build overall. Any other comments on this build, TJ? Yeah, I agree. It's another unique one from what we've seen so far. Yeah. T- two studs up top, two punt plays down low, and then filling out the middle there. Um, I think, I think like, just to talk about a specific player for some reason, H- Hovland's been an interesting one because all of a sudden mm-hmm. he's been putting really well the last, like, two weeks like really really well and before that he was really really ball striking well and now that's kind of fallen off so he's just going to be an interesting one to track because if he ever puts both of those together at the same time I think he he has the, the kind of runaway potential to see you know do what a Morikawa did and and win yeah. a big tournament at some point down the line yeah I keep saying it right I think it's Morikawa gap and then it's so hard because Wolf it looks like it's Wolf one time and then you see like She's what like plus did seven on Saturday. Well, yeah. And, and so <laughs> it's like a blow up round with a complete ejection. And then yeah. on Sunday, Hovland goes what minus seven through nine or something to start his day. And then all of a sudden those chipping woes come back and he, you know, has one that he chips two feet up the hill and rolls back even further. Yeah. That's it up the hill, issue. almost rolls back again. It's like what his game is so inconsistent and so off the wall, yeah. but it's like you said, and he'll be fun for this week because talking about a guy that can score and outscore his position that's a guy, right? Hovland can make those eagles, makes a lot put of eagles those streaks yeah. together, things like that. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, I think that's probably a good segue. We went through everything for how you guys get there, talked about some of the stuff we went through. Any more comments on last week's results? No, I think it was an interesting week. And now, now we trim up the field even more and have a no-cut event. So I think it'll be a different, a little bit of a different strategy, different approach as we head into the, the remainder of the playoffs here. Yeah, so as it stands right now, the full 70 are in. I mean, it's, there's nobody that's withdrew from before or anything like that. We'll monitor it as the week goes on. Just complete disrespect to Jim Herman at the bottom, coming off his big win a couple of weeks ago, put him at the dead stone minimum. So we we'll, uh, we'll, won't go that far down. Like I said, if you guys want to get a more in-depth look at the preview for the field this week, Kenny and myself, Kenny Kim, will be going over this on the Fantasy Golf Degenerates podcast. You can download it for free. It's presented by Roto Grinders, sponsored by Roto Grinders. So check that out if you want more, but TJ and I always like to go through this a little bit. And yeah, so biggest thing here is a 70 man field. 
talked about it a little bit before with the DJ stuff being a you know an eight to one Vegas favorite coming off playing some of the best golf we've ever ever seen. What I'm curious about is if you think, and we've got Rom and, J- and DJ at the top, do you think DJ keeps that going? Or do you think he just tries to save a little bit in the bag for the final week at the Tour Championship and then take home the player of the year? Because it would be something to see, right? When you think about the Brooks, whether it's a joke or not, or whether he took it seriously or, or even bothers him, who knows, not too much bothers DJ. But with Brooks making those comments at the PGA, like, what, DJ's got one major? Kind of like, who cares? I got four. Uh, last year, if you guys remember, DJ or Brooks, everyone will have their opinion on this, but Brooks is you know, said to have got snubbed by Rory McIlroy because Rory didn't win a major. He won the RBC Canadian Open, the Players, and then eventually the FedEx Cup. So I still think any of the best strokes gained as far as overall stats that people had seen in a long time, talking back to that A-plus game you mentioned earlier, that was certainly Rory last year. It won't be Rory this year. We know that much. But I think if DJ... You know, does damage in this event or wins again. I mean, it's pretty much over. And then obviously, if he wins the FedEx Cup, that'd be huge. Uh, it's something he's never done yet. And that'd be 15 million more going into his, uh, you know, ever growing bank account. So, what do you think DJ does this week? And where are you at between him and Rom right at the very top at 11K plus? Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how things shake out. I mean, it's so hard to bet against him after seeing him do it so consistently for, for four straight rounds. And, and not only those four rounds, right? You talked about it. Aside from the the 80-80 withdrawal, I mean, he's been pretty much lights out the last four or five tournaments. So my, my lean is that people will will go back to him, and I, I will probably even consider it myself, even for the high price tag, just because, like we said, with no cut, if if there's a guy that you really, really like and think is a cut above the rest, you can – pay whatever you need to pay and then make it work around him without having to worry about guys missing the cut. I, you know, also like Rom as well. I think that yeah. will likely end up being more of the tournament pivot is my guess. It, it, it's always hard to tell this early, but I think, I think people will want to go back to DJ, even though they, they typically don't like going back to the previous week's winner. I think he just made such a statement this weekend. What, what are you thinking? Uh, that's kind of what I'm thinking. So that it's almost like the reverse whatever you want to call it, a double reverse narrative, whatever you want to say is where everyone will say, you know, you know, don't, you don't want to go back to DJ because he probably can't win again. He might save some in the bag, blah, blah, blah. And then they go back to him anyway, because you know, he's going to get ownership. He just played incredible golf and he's right up here and he's a huge favorite and everything. It makes sense, but we'll see. It's so hard to predict at the start of the week. I just feel like that's going to be the talk around is that, you know, normally you wouldn't go back to a winner, but this week you can, if anybody can go back to back, it's definitely DJ. Uh, there's only some certain guys that I can think of. And it's like, you know, Tiger, of course, way back when uh, Rory, Jason Day, when he was, you know, prime number one in the world was going back to backs. So I know that uh, JT can go back to back. We've seen that. I'm not saying these other guys can't. I'm just saying these are the ones I see do it. And DJ is another one. So I don't have any problem with you going back to DJ. I see cards got Rom tagged up here already. That's interesting because I was already thinking that I really like John Rom. Uh, you know, if it's going to be that DJ's 30% and Rom's going to be 10 or 15, I would have more Rom in, in large field tournaments. I, I just think it's a good play. And then, like I said, because I think it's going to be don't go back to DJ, but everyone does go back to DJ, sort of that, you know, they say they're not going to or they don't know if they can, and then they all click the button anyway. That makes me think that Rom will come in a little bit lower ownership. But we'll have to see as the week goes on. It's definitely going to be one to watch. Uh, going into the next range here, we got four guys in the 10K range. We've got JT, Bryson. Rory and Webb. What's your thoughts on this range? I mean, J- JT is probably my favorite off the cuff. I mean, just pro- I-, I feel like I like both DJ and Rom almost a bit more. I mean, Bryson just is all over the place. Rory seems to be a little bit all over the place. I, I imagine that this this could be a little bit of a of a lower owned range just with the two guys up at 11 K that, that people like to play to begin with and are also playing well. And then when you look into the nine K range, you've got some, some of people's favorites as well. So it could be a little bit of a, of a dead range from an ownership perspective. Uh, but JT, I think is still solid. It seemed like I was following him a bit and he just couldn't make a putt, which that's right. seems to be happening to him often. I mean, he's missing like five footers, seven footers, like regularly. So it's not like he's struggling with his approach game. It, that's still there, and I think that he's still always a nice play. And 
he's been he's been pretty consistently the highest priced golfer, so you're getting a little bit of a discount on him now. I mean, Rory at ten three. When do we ever see Rory at ten three? And I still don't want to play him, which is crazy. <laughs> yeah, you don't, <laughs> right? You never see that. He's, he's almost... just not doing anything. I don't know. It's tough. Yeah. With with Rory though, he's he's not doing anything until he is. Right. And sometimes that can spark him, you know, right. something, something like watching DJ put on a, you know, something that only really, in my opinion, Tiger in his prime or Rory when he's on can do like that much, you know, that incredible. It's like I say, for people that aren't getting that of how incredible that feat was in this new era of having all these great golfers and, you know, the, the world that Tiger created, you know, people always go, oh, well, no one's going to be as good. We're not, it, no one's ever going to be as good as Tiger. It's facts because he created all these beasts and all these people that are up and comers that even have a guy like Cam Davis at last week's, you know, bottom of the barrel pricing was such a sweet swing that just can come through and score like crazy and actually contend at one point in the tournament. So, I mean, it's just all these great young players and all these up and coming talents were the best spot ever that we've seen for golf. I'm with you on JT. Just can't make a putt. I do wonder if it's a little bit, I know you could say this sounds dumb because he just won with bones on his bag, but I wonder, you know, some of the putting stuff lately has to do with Jimmy Johnson, not being on the bag His caddy of long time. I'm sure. You know that we've talked about before with Webb, who's down at the bottom here without, who hasn't, you know, before when he didn't have Paul Tesori on the back, he reads a lot of putts for him. Scotty Scheffler, uh, interesting side note, was, you know, random as can be, his caddy jumped up to see where his shot went yesterday on, like, the ninth hole and then did something to his calf or his ankle and ends up having to get carted out, and he needed a replacement caddy mid-round to come in. And after the, the lightning break or whatever it was, he said, you know, actually, he reads a lot of putts for me. I've had him on my bag for, you know, all but five Corn Ferry Tour events that I played in, so... These caddies are important, and you wonder if it's just those little things, even though, like I said, I know JT just won with them on the bag, so could be moot point, but I think it's still little things, and I definitely like JT. The other side note here, and we're not going to spend too much more time you know, on these ranges, but Bryson DeChambeau, this is a new course, right? The, you know, Olympia is a different course that people haven't seen for a very long time. The last PGA Tour event was the 2003 U.S. Open, which Jim Furyk won uh, way back when. Tiger came like T20 in that event. Uh, and then if you look at the most recent event that people will talk about that was played at it, there's been some other stuff, you know, uh, two things will come up. One in this range is Bryson DeChambeau. He won the 2005, 2015 U.S. Amateur here, uh, which was, you know, essentially the thing that you'll hear most people talk about, about Bryson, but a different Bryson right now, beefy, you know, bulked up Bryson, whatever you want to call him. Uh, you know, you got to get in the fairway. You got to be you know, somewhat all around. And I don't know if he has that right now, but Kenny for sure. So he might go overlooked a little bit and that'd be, you know, an interesting reason. Rory is of the price. That's why he's going to get mentioned. And then Webb just always goes overlooked and got more expensive than last week. So I think he'll be low owned and you can pick and choose what you want to do with him. The second thing that'll be talked about, and one of them's in this range and one of them's when we get to the bottom eights is Wolf was first, I believe it's the 2018. It's called like the Ilney championship. And they also played at this course. And he was first playing for Oklahoma State. Morikawa was second right behind him, and Hovland wasn't far behind them. So just that's in the individual portion of that event. So that's sort of the other thing you'll hear that gets talked up a little bit. And all these guys are like 35 to 1 this week. Really tough to get behind. Or sorry, Hovland and Wolf are 33, 35 to 1. Morikawa is like 22. These are just tough numbers to bet. But if you you know bet Morikawa at the PGA Championship, you, you were close to that. I think he was 35 to 1 there. So it's now he's getting even... Tougher to bet at 22 to one, but uh, talk to me about this range. You got Xander, Berger, Morikawa, Day, and Scotty Scheffler up to 9K now. Any thoughts in here? Yeah. So as we start to get into this range down below, it's going to be interesting to see how people handle the guys that were, were relatively chalky last week and, and missed the cut. So you've got what Morikawa, Day, and Cantlay all missed the cut last week yeah. and are all guys that maybe not so much today, but obviously Morikawa and Cantlay, people have been playing a lot. Uh, it seems like Xander and Morikawa just reverse prices every single week. Like what one week, one guy's $400 more than the other. The next week they reverse places, but I like them both again. Xander continues to be uh, a popular and a solid play right in that 10K range, but doesn't doesn't quite, he like, it's almost like, is he meeting value or not by constantly just play burger. having these like, man, decent, you're skipping yeah. burger. Why don't again? we just play burger? I am skipping yeah, burger again. Why do I do that? I don't know. Yeah, it's me too. Maybe, I'm the same way. I want to play. <laughs> I, I want to play Xander. Like yeah, I want to play right. Xander. I want to play Morikawa. I don't really love all the other ones, but I, you know, I kind of like cards and I are have, of the same mindset so far. Just seeing what he's got tagged up here. Cause yeah. what's your thoughts on Cantley? I mean, I mentioned it last week. It's just like the guy just never does anything for his money. And last week, I think, you know, I was on, it was with Noto, I think, 
that we talked about this. I said, what was the difference between Cantlay and Matsuyama? Matsuyama was 600 bucks cheaper. They're both incredible ball strikers, tee to green players that seem to pop for two or three rounds and just never seem to close it out. But they could have a big Sunday like when, you know, Matsuyama won at the Bridgestone with that big Sunday WGC event or when Cantlay won at the Memorial, which is all we really think about them of, of, of recent, right? Where we can think about them winning. So again, they don't always need winning upside. Cantlay's getting down there to 8.9K now. But what's your thoughts on him at 8.9K? It's kind of interesting because cards is on him. I was kind of liking him. You mentioned him going outside that range. Where, where are you at with him as far as overall gameplay goes? Yeah, he definitely jumps out to me as just being a little bit underpriced there. I mean, I think he's come down from like 10.6 at this point and it's just been slowly dropping each and every week. Now, granted, I, I guess it's somewhat worthy because he hasn't hasn't been putting up the results but like you said he always has that potential great ball striker has that upside but the thing with him is you're never really going to get can't like can't late eight nine you're you're not going to get him at low ownership i think he's always going to come in at 15 percent in that range i think at least i think people like him too much similar thing with Finau, uh another another similar situation although he's had more better results of recent but struggles with the putter on occasion. You got the Matsuyama. So it's gonna be it's gonna be tough to to decipher the guys in this range, both from yeah. a from an ownership perspective and from a from an equity standpoint. I mean I think the the guys that that jump out are the the can't lay Finau, Matsuyama a bit. You got Tiger in there. Kisner seems a bit expensive or more expensive than I would expect to see him at eight four. Hatton is I, I like Hatton generally speaking because He's a ball striker that, that has actually shown that he can have hot rounds with the putter, right? It's like, I feel like with Cantlay and Matsuyama, we're, we're waiting on this theoretical what if they do putt well one time. But That's it. Hatton has yeah. actually shown it recently. So I, I've kind of come around on just accepting like, hey, some guys can't putt and, and maybe accept that and, and don't play them as much and, and take the guys that have shown somewhat recently that, that while they may not putt well every round that they have those spike rounds because that's what you need the ball striker that can spike with the putter on a given week and give you that that top five or winning finish yeah i'll have to make a decision on cantley as the week goes on you know i'm kind of liking him, but when you mention it like that and i sort of just think of these things these are the tough decisions this is definitely the tough range but cantley yeah. doesn't really win reed wins all the time reed can putt you will need to putt here this week he has the around the green game for if you are missing these are much smaller green complexes we don't always go into a course preview here but these are smaller greens and you get a guy like reed who's wins tournaments wins big events wants to make a push everything there against in between guys that just don't win now fino is interesting because he's kind of like a jt or like a bryson where he can outscore for way lower price has it in him we just haven't seen him close the door yet but he gets those top tens and at 8.7 i love that he's normally better on bent like here but or poa same it's a bent poa mix but last week uh, the only thing he was missing, he missed the cut, but he was really just, he really missed it with the putter. He had no putter to show whatsoever. If he can get that, I'd rather take, I think I'd take him over Cantlay still. You know what I mean? So that's sort of where I'm at there. Yeah. Tiger over Matsuyama, a, a guy that's, you know, prolific all-time player, had an awesome Sunday round, by the way. Uh, so got to be feeling pretty good coming into this. Found a little bit with the putter. That's been the problem as of late. But if he can do that again, I think we can go back to him. Matsuyama's, you know, a guy that you're looking for that upside in 8.5K. You kind of got to play him. But I will say this, Kevin Kisner, man, he talks about it openly, kind of like Joel Damon. He said it again last week. He was quoted as saying, look, when DJ's playing like that, I just move to the side and try and put as much money in my bank account as possible. Well, now's the time to put the money in your bank account. <laughs> now's the time to make it. He's done really well at the last two tour championships. He's going to want to get there again and have a chance to pop off and make some of that money. Played great last week. I think it, the consensus will be that he's overpriced and he has been doing very well as of, as of late. So I certainly like him in large fields uh, be really, you know, I'll be, it'll be something to see what people do going back to a guy like Harris English, you know, the price goes up now. He also played some of the best golf we've seen. Like you mentioned, if you're shooting 19, well, I blew it on the last hole. It could have been 20 under at least if not 21. Uh, that's a, a birdie hole at the, at the last, at the least, sorry. And, and he, ended up bogeying it and they didn't care, right? They wanted to get out of there. So it is what it is. But, um, you know, he played some really great golf. Scott's another guy that missed the cut. Cards is going back to all these guys. Uh, and then I mentioned with the Wolf, Hovland, you know, Casey's played well at the PGA Championship, Horschel and Louie. So any any thoughts on this bottom range? English will be an interesting one this week. He, you know, I think he, he feels a little bit 
overpriced just when you look at his name next to those others. But at the same time, the results have been there. So mm-hmm. uh, eventually you, you just kind of got to wake up to him. Maybe he's a, a better golfer than we're used to him being. I, I continue to like Adam Scott, uh, probably look to go back towards him again. I just, you know, he, he's just getting back in the swing of things. He's He's been playing okay, not great, but I just think long-term, I really like him as a golfer. Hovland, you know, we talked about him earlier. I think the around the green game still is just what scares me with him. I just think at yeah. any at any given time, it's kind of like Paul Casey. They can just have one hole where where they're next to the green in two, and then all of a sudden they're making a double because they're they're chipping it three times. So I think my my lean in this area would be English and, and Scott off the cuff. Uh, yeah, there's your guy your guy Louis. I guess got a little bit of a price jump there, but he's been yeah. putting up the results like you said. I'm sure he'll come in at that low ownership again. Nobody wanted to play him. Wolf continues to be someone who has just wild inconsistency. So I think he's always in play for GPPs, but always someone that's that's tough to trust just from a – I think he's a wide, wide range of outcomes, not, not only in a yeah. given week, but in, in a given round. Like he, he can shoot plus seven one round and mi- minus seven one round. So embrace he's volatility a- with him. No, you're the, the volatility in the swings, you said it, and that's probably you want to put him in your lineups yeah. and pack some safety around him. I do think it's kind of, you know, we're, this range of English, Scott, Wolf, Hovland, Casey could all be really popular. And I'm leaning more towards like Hatton, Kisner, and Louie right now. Mm-hmm. Again, it's early mm-hmm. and that's just my original thoughts, but, uh, you know, that's sort of where I'm going with it. And like you mentioned it with the Wolf volatility, the Hovland, and, and the Wolf and Hovland thing are that they could really, really outscore that those price tags. But then you talk about, like I just mentioned, how I like Reed because of that stuff around the green and the putter. That's normally not two things that you're going to get out of Victor Hovland. And yes, he had a great round on Sunday, and that may bring people to believe that this could happen again. But I don't know if I'll be as big on that. I'll have to wait and see sort of what stuff looks like and how, I'm, how things are shaking out for me as the week goes on. And that's the benefit to you guys. I know this show is free, but you know Tuesday, the show I do with uh, Noto and Cards. Wednesday is when it all wraps up together, and I'll give you my final thoughts based on where I'm at as far as you know. now I've thought about everything throughout the week. Ownership's out. I can take that into play because it's really tough to tell on day one and then some of the stuff just starts to be everyone saying the same thing and feeding off of each other and that can lead to the narratives and the group think where people are getting in on certain plays more than others and that's when you want to be able to look to take some leverage off that and make some pivots as we go down a couple minutes left here we'll round it out tj anybody in this you know 7.5 and up that stands out maybe two or three guys there's our guy abraham answer 7.7 again i'll probably go back I, i i don't know uh I'll probably go back to the well on it, but I'll need to think about it more and look at it more. But I mean, everyone wanted to play him last week. His price hasn't changed. The situation hasn't changed a ton. So probably look to go back to him. Henley's been playing really well lately. And I think is, if not the first, one of the, one of the top in approach in the field over the last couple of rounds. So I see that cards has him tagged. He's been, been playing well. He's interesting to me. Um, let's see what else. I'm not really big on Sun JM. I'm just, he doesn't really do it for me. Like his thing used to be that he was a good safety play, but he doesn't even seem to have that going for him. So I, I'm not, not big on Sun J. He might, he might be like um, a cheaper Matt Wolf though. Right. If you want to save some money, it's like the, what's really yeah. the big difference. They both got yeah. their wins. They're both, uh, they're both incredible talents when they're on, they're on. Maybe he's got it back yeah. a little, who knows, but that's my whole point. Like you can almost just save the money and take the risk on with him. And obviously whatever the results are, we'll deal with it from there. But the point is, is it's what's the real big difference. Except there's a lot of volatility in a play like Sung J M. Yeah. Yeah. The seven K range is interesting to me. I mean, my, my, my first, my first instinct is that the eight K range seemed a lot stronger than this like low seven Ks. And, I you know, I, I, I'm assuming that as you get into the six Ks that, Maybe with some of the the six K plays, there's not a ton of difference between some of the low seven K guys. So uh, we'll, we'll probably want to try try and look at some of the cheaper spots so that we can get in as many of those eight K guys as possible, and maybe have some some cheaper ones mixed in there. But yeah, like you know, guys like Leishman, Connors, Neiman, for five hundred dollars cheaper than some of the other guys. Yeah. Kevin Na, like Kevin yeah. Na, yeah, I like some of these. So. We go down. I mean, this is one we don't normally go heavy into here, but I mean, I think that's where you're, what you're saying is right. It looks like the bottom sevens has all the good plays. 
versus the yeah. upper sevens, right? When you got, you know, you know, Fitzpatrick, Norrin, Henley, Woodland, Answer, M, Watson, it's good names, good plays, but are they really that much different than when you go down here to Kevin Na, Leishman at 7.2K? That seems right. pretty low, and I thought that about English last week at 7.6K, so that could be a sign. Uh, Neiman, 7.1, that seems low for him comparatively to, you know, Hadwin, Hubbard, Mackenzie Hughes down here. Lanto really seems to crush his price tag, so I like him. At 6.9, he's, you know, there is no, I don't believe Davis made it through. Did he? No, he didn't. So, um, yeah, Davis my, is not you, playing. I wish yeah, no, I, I would have locked him in this week in a, in a no cut of yeah. 10 for sure. <laughs> it would have been funny to see because the price probably would have went up, but I kind of like Lanto in that same scenario mm-hmm. for that upside at that low price. Uh, Gooch is back, Gooch cards likes him, so he's there. But then there's a lot of guys down there, you know, Fratelli, Post, and Streelman. Shelton, you know, did his job and got in and got through, and he's seen this course as yeah. well back in 2015 at that. Same am that I talked about with uh, Bryson winning. And then uh, Sebastian Munoz stands mm-hmm. out to me early. You know, Mav McNeely, yeah. guys that I think could just really outdo these price tags. And you're taking on some risk for sure. But I think it's more likely that, you know, McNeely outscores a 6.2K tag than a guy like Jim Herman, you know, goes uh, goes off again and takes this thing down at 6K. So uh, pick pick your poison down here. Anything else you want to mention on this or we get out of here? No, yeah, I think at f- first look that given the, the no-cut event and wanting to get some of the top guys in, that, that maybe we see some stars and scrubs types build come into play where, where you get up to a, a DJ and a ROM and then have some 8K guys and then and then maybe a, a 6K guy or two. But we'll continue to look at it throughout the week. We'll have uh, all of our content coming out and should be should be a fun tournament regardless, obviously. I think at any time you get this stacked of a field and – you know, everyone's playing four rounds. I think it'll be an interesting four days. No, certainly. I agree, man. Thanks so much again. Love doing the show with you. This was awesome. I hope it helps you guys. If you have any feedback for us, please let us know. Other than that, you can follow me on Twitter at toe tag and tambo. You can follow TJ on Twitter at TJ all five, one, two, four DFS. I always double check that one. Am I right? Yep. You're right. You got it. So other than that guys, thank you and good luck.